So the paper is titled Learning Physical Graph Representations from Visual Scenes. The entire idea here is can we take a look at a scene and try to build some kind of hierarchical graph from that scene? Um, there's a lot of technical jargon in this paper, some of which I've included, some of which I've completely abstracted, um, hopefully to, to benefit the, the clarity of the presentation. So feel free to ask questions along the way. You can uh, hit the arrow or space bar. Just, uh, you were able to, like, did you click on the thing? I guess I'll have to control yeah. it from my touch bar. <laughs> okay. Um, so the basic idea behind why this, this paper exists is because CNNs fundamentally do not learn structure representations of a particular scene. So there's no way to, to understand how a particular object works with other objects. There's no way to understand what are the components of a specific object. Um, and I think these are properties that we're all pretty familiar with. Um, the paper highlights that humans effectively group scenes into object-centric representations about various objects in a the scene, their poses, their characteristics, such as their physical properties, and their relationship to other objects. So, uh, are these, uh, these, line, these words, are these words you're taking from their paper, or these yeah. words you, or you're saying, because this is how we talk about it too, so I'm just curious, are they using these, these terms? Yeah, so the, I, I, I intermix my, my words with, with some of theirs. Um, that, that sentence is um, from their paper. Okay. Yeah. Um, so th their idea is to introduce this, this notion of what is called a, a physical scene graph. Like I mentioned, that's basically a hierarchical, hierarchical graph of a particular scene. And this is purely a, a deep learning system to do this. And I think the key thing that they highlight in this paper is that they learn this by uh, self-supervision. There's, so there's no need for a ground truth labeling of a scene and the particular objects in that scene. Um, and they test this basically on, on very simple environments like Gibson, which is similar to the face, Facebook habitat environment that we're using right now, but it's, it's not interactive. Um, and primitives, which is effectively just like a, a 3D room with some primitive shapes. So are they, are they working with 3D basic data or are they working with images and extracting graphs from the images? So the, the environments are 3D, but they're technically working off of 2D frames um, in movies that they process. So, oh, so, so they take a 2D frame, but they're also taking time versions of it. Yes. As, as if the sensor, as if the viewer is moving through the space? Yes, correct. All right, so it isn't, um, uh, okay. So it's, it is a, in some sense, a sensory motor system. Uh, um, right. Do they, do they have, I guess you'll go into this in a bit, but do they actually control the movements or is it just passive like the world is moving? It's, 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 total, it's passive in the sense that I think these are fixed movements in that environment. Okay. Um, I, I think uh, the, the environment is not interactive at all. So it's um, the, the scene, everything, all the objects in that scene are stationary. Um, yeah, but, but the viewer is moving through the scene. Yes. So um, that's, a key, that's a key differentiator. And then Subita was, I think Subita was asking, well, but they're, they, they're not taking advantage of the actual not knowledge of the movement, perhaps. They're just, they're just looking at how things change. Yeah, I mean, if I interpret that uh, you know, the, from the network standpoint, it's like they're seeing video sequences. Yeah. yeah. They, have no, they have no control or anything. Of it. So it's not really sensory motor. It's more like analyzing video. Yeah, but it is, it is in some sense uh, potentially able to... Um, uh, it would be like us watching a video of someone moving through a maze or a game, right? We can use, yeah, we, can yeah, use yeah. We, we can, even though we're not directing behavior, we can use motion clues uh, that exist in the, in the video to determine depth and, uh, and direction of movement. We can, we can infer movement from changing video. Uh, yeah, that's right. I just wouldn't call it sensory motor. Okay, but it's getting closer. I mean, here we're talking about basically learning three-dimensional graphs of complex, uh, hierarchical scenes um, by movement, so it's getting closer. Yeah, yeah, and there's a there's a fair amount of there's some other work along these lines too, but that's one of the reasons I think we want to talk about yeah. it. Yeah, I'm gonna highlight some caveats later in the presentation, 
but I think I should say a few now, that there are a lot of deep learning tricks and, uh, and strategies that they use to make this work. Um, like I said, I've, I've, I've abstracted to the ones that I think that are, uh, that are not gonna help with the clarity of understanding the system. Um, but I think we should still keep that in mind. And this still requires a bunch of training data and all that stuff to work. So the, the basics of, of, of how they build this graph is everything is built bottom up. So nodes are basically, they, they say that at the top of the hierarchy, at the top of the hierarchy, but it's considered um, the, the nodes that you start off with. And these are the larger groupings, like whole objects in the particular scene. And nodes towards the bottom of the hierarchy, but this is technically nodes that you, you build over time, um, are, are smaller groups, like particular parts of an object. And the edges are actually how um, various objects are held together. So this graph is very much like a hypergraph. So a single edge can join any number of vertices. Um, and for example, if I had specific nodes at the bottom of a hierarchy that describe various parts um, of one single object, the edge that holds them together describes how they're held together. Um, it's worth, it's, it's very what, what, what does that mean? What do you mean by hypergraph? I don't know, how's that different than just a graph? So a regular graph, um, an edge only connects two vertices. A hypergraph, um, an edge can connect any number of vertices. I guess I'm not understanding how that's possible. Uh, if, a ver if a vertice is a, uh, a feature or an object in the scene, how can I have, um, uh, you, are you saying that could be have a relative position to many other things? Is that it? An edge, an edge can only connect two things, right? How can, a, how, how can a single edge connect more than two things? It's, uh, it's useful to visualize this not as, a, as an edge, as like a line between two vertices, but rather as like a, a blob. And in that blob are many vertices. So that's like what, what's considered an edge here. Okay, well then that seems like that's not really a graph then. It's, it's still a graph in the sense that um, I'll get into to more about how um, hierarchies, hierarchies are built inside, this, built inside this graph. So it's still a graph, but it's not like your traditional edge. There's no, a single edge doesn't connect only two vertices. So in a, in a very simple example, if I, I guess it's not a graph, it's a hypergraph. Yeah, <laughs> by definition. <laughs> okay, that's what you mean by hypergraph. That's why I first saw saying what the hypergraph. If a hypergraph is like, oh, an edge really doesn't connect two things. It's sort of a, some other concept. It's a blob to blob connection. Well, that's okay. <laughs> can, I, can we think of this as sort of um, clustering a bunch of uh, vertices together and, and then just connecting something, some other cluster to some other cluster? Yeah. So it's like a well, hierarchy. I mean, in some sense, you can say uh, the, the relationship of the coffee cup to the table is is an edge, but the coffee cup itself is composed of many nodes or, or many um, at, you know, components and edges, and so is the table. So if you want to think, of, if, if that's what you mean, then that's fine. But I would still say, you know, the way I've always viewed that is a coffee cup is a single object in one instance, but it can also be decomposed into others. Um, if that, maybe that's what they're saying here. Yeah, um, uh, that's, that's, yeah. So then sometimes it's maybe like there's multiple, you know, I always view it as multiple graphs. There's a graph for the coffee cup, a graph for the table, and then I can say, well, take that entity and make it a single node, um, which is a hier hierarchical graph, but I wouldn't call it like a still in that, in that sense, every edge still connects two things. But all right, I, we don't need to beat this up more, but I'm just trying to understand it. It's very important to note that these graphs are spatially registered. So every node in the graph is tied to a specific location in the image from which it's derived. Um, and the node attributes basically describe the physical characteristics of that object. So the position of that object, the shape and the appearance, the color and stuff like that. Just to be clear, this is a location in the image, not a location in 3D space? Yeah, it's a location in that image frame. Okay, that's, that's a bit odd. So the, uh, I think as I, as I explain this, it will become more clear, but this is how they refer back to the original um, data that they're collecting from your from your camera. They're, this is the only way that they they have like some physical mapping between my graph, the nodes in my graph, and what corresponds to the series of, of frames that I'm looking at in the uh, uh, the data, the raw data that I'm collecting. 
Okay. Um, there's a, a bunch of text here. I'll, I'll go through one by one. Um, the vertices in, in this graph are arranged in hierarchies, like I, I, like I mentioned. Um, and every single um, set of, of, they call it a level, um, is denoted by V of L. And V of L essentially contains all the vertices in a specific level L. Um, the edges between vertices at level L and L plus one um, are what denotes this hierarchy. Um, and this is what they call a child to parent edge. Um, and this represents basically part to whole relationships. You build these vertices as you explore a particular um, scene more and more. Um, so if my camera maybe zoomed in on a, a particular bowl or a coffee cup in this instance, you would represent um, new things in, in a new hierarchy or a new level. And you would connect the old level to your new one using this child to parent edge. And this is supposed to become more descriptive as you go along. There are also edges um, between vertices in a particular level, and those are called within level edges. Um, and they represent some abstract relationships between the objects or parts in that, in that level. Um, in this specific implementation in this paper, um, they only describe the physical connections between, um, between objects in that level. Uh, they could encode various different things, like how um, one object would potentially interact with another object using some physics, um, but that's not what happens in this paper. This is purely how um, one object is physically connected to another one. Is it so physical that, connections or just physical relations? I mean, uh, is this, yeah. I think in, so they don't have to be touching. Yeah, you know, they, they don't have to be touching. They don't have to be touching. But um, there's this very ambiguous case where, let's say, I have like a coffee cup and I have it in front of a background, and the movie that I'm looking at is in front of both of those things. From the viewer's perspective or from the camera's perspective, it's hard to understand what's touching what. Um, but that's how they 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 do this in, in their case, where they consider the coffee cup and the background to be separate because. The, the coffee cup follows some very similar characteristics along all different parts of that same cup. And the, the background is different. I don't know how they stress tested this in the sense that what if I looked at a background that looks identical to the coffee cup at that angle? I don't know how that's how that's done. Um, I guess I'm still, it's still confusing me. We, we're talking about edges now at a particular level. So this would be like the coffee cup relative to the so the stapler type of thing. And then you say physical connections, the edges represent physical connections and you've emphasized that. So um, I would expect the edges to represent the physical relationship between these. Um, like, you know, they're separated by certain distance or something like that. Um, so I'm just, I'm just confused by the language of physical connections. In, in the case of the, the coffee cup and the stapler, I don't think that there is any sort of physical connection between the two. Um, but would the would would the edge still represent? Is that what you mean? But because that's what this edge these edges would represent, right? Would the edge say, "Oh, it's three centimeters to the left of the coffee cup"? Nothing like that. No, oh, no. Okay. Um, so, so in that case, they wouldn't even there would be no physical. There yeah, would be no edge between the stapler. There is, the yeah. Based off of how they've described it, there is no edge between the two. Um, I, I, so, is this then different parts of the coffee cup? Basically, basically. So um, I, I'm, I'm starting to think of this as like uh, the edge represents contiguous parts of a particular object. It's not, okay. it's, it's not equipped to describe um, displacement between two objects. Yeah, I guess in, in the way I thought about this is really isn't really a distinction between those two in some sense. It's like you can just take any two things whether it's part of the same thing or it's part of a scene, and you can say what is this, what is an edge would represent the relationship between. Uh, I don't want to beat this up again, but you emphasize this term physical connections, and it's still a bit confusing to me. But maybe we shouldn't spend more time on it. Um, yeah, I can I can come back to this um, if it's not clear. Hopefully by the end of the, the presentation. Um, but they also determine something called um, attribute vectors. And these attribute vectors are, are very simple. They're just vectors that describe for every vertex in a particular level, um, what are the physical properties of that vertex? 
Um, and these are purely just uh, what's the shape, what's the appearance, what's the color. And in some cases, they manually provide information like what's the physical normal for, for that surface, uh, for the object that they're looking at. And this is not something that's, that's uh, derived from, from just looking at the scene. This is something that they already have knowledge of. Um, I, I think that'll become more clear as I go through some examples. Well, that's, very, that, that's very similar to the way we've been thinking about um, uh, nodes uh, being like you would, um, like a surface would have a sort of a, a normal component to it. Um, are they using the words, are they using the word vertex in exactly the same way we use the word nodes? Or, or Marcus uses the words nodes? They use vertices and nodes interchangeably. And I think it, I think it means the same thing. Okay. It's an interesting question for our language. We've been using the word node and these people are using the word vertex. I don't know if one is more understood, generally understood or better than the other one. Um, I'm just questioning whether we're using the right language. I like the word node. To me, that was something I understood, but vertex means the same thing, I think. I, I think vertex is more specific to graphs, whereas nodes can be more generic. Hmm. Yeah, I like the word node because because we assign a lot of different things to a node, and so are they. Um, but you know, vertex sort of suggests a, a physical part of a graph as opposed to like a, a, low, a, a place where you can put a bunch of things. So, all right, we'll stick with nodes for now. I just was curious. Mm. There's also something called a spatio-temporal registration, um, and this is also a set that per, that basically is tied to any given level of this hierarchy. Um, and this links each vertex or node to a given subset of pixels in something that they call the base tensor. And this is the thing that I was describing um, in the previous slide. The base tensor is effectively how they have this physical mapping between um, the nodes or vertices in this graph as they build to the specific series of, of image frames um, in the raw data. This is the only mapping that, that really exists. Um, this base tensor is of size um, T by height by width by C. I'll describe what that means. T is the number of image frames. So we can think of this as like a, a movie. Um, and C is the number of attribute vectors in that particular level. So as you could possibly guess, F represents this base tensor. And this base tensor, this full base tensor represents the ground level node from which the entire graph is built. So uh, up to that point. Uh, so I mean, this is like the, if it's built bottom up, this is the starting node for everything. Um, this is the full scene. Um, and this is all the attribute vectors at that very, very, um, at, at that first level. Uh, this describes all the attributes of all the objects in that particular scene. Um, so if you're like at the, well, if it links each vertex to a given subset. So if you are at the coffee cup vertex, but you can then you know all the pixels that belong to the coffee cup through the through history and through this video is that it's like a segmentation yeah basically okay. yeah but that that's that's taking it one step further this is if um what, what you're saying is absolutely correct but that's built from the ground level node there's only one single node that you start off with oh. and that node is effectively the entire scene throughout all the time that you're looking at it from there, you you would make it more granular. You would look at maybe a specific node, and that node is the coffee cup. And you would see how um, the the original base tensor relates to nodes as you as you keep going up and up. Okay. Um, you would maybe start off with the coffee cup, then you go into the coffee cup's handle, and you go into the colors of the coffee cup handle, and you just keep going further and further. It seems to me this technique, and maybe I'm jumping ahead, but it's going to be very specific to this this scene. That is knowledge of the coffee cup wouldn't be transferable to another scene in some sense. Yeah, so this is, a, this is something that they actually bring up in the, uh, in, the, in the paper where they say that even though this what seems like apparently the, the system generalizes pretty well to, um, to similar scenes with similar objects that are not identical to the ones you trained on. Um, I, uh, Maybe I can I, I can show you guys some results towards the end. I don't have them in this presentation, but I can I can pull them up on the paper. I'm also curious about how that particular thing works. I'll be out in a second. Okay. I'll uh, move on to the next one.
So they have this very, very big pipeline for how this works. And I've tried my best to separate them out into their individual components. Um, there's a few parts of this pipeline. The first one- yeah, I, have, I have to interrupt. I have to step out for a minute. You guys keep going and I'll come back as soon as I can. Okay. How long roughly do you think you'd be? I don't know. Uh, okay. This guy's contract is here and he, I just have to answer some questions. So okay. Hopefully not more than a few minutes. Just keep going. You might want to, yeah. So this is the first stage of their pipeline. This is feature extraction. And this is given the raw scene or the raw series of images in that scene. How do I process them? They build this convolutional recurrent neural net um, and performs feature extraction from the series of images. What they effectively describe is every single layer here locally has recurrent layers that process the, the series of frames. Um, and then across the entire um, architecture, they have some kind of skip connections to preserve um, the more granular features that you learn towards the end versus the more raw features that you have in the beginning. This is, um, I, I spoke to the author to, to understand why they did this. And they, he said that this was um, basically a, a manual design decision just to make sure that they have the relevant features um, throughout the entire network so that granular features aren't lost raw data features are lost here. But what you see there on the top left is sort of what's output from the, the, the conf RNN towards the end. Um, it's just a, a, a representation of, of the raw data, which is right below it. I, I've heard of something called an RCNN before. Is this different from that? I think this is different. Uh, this is the CRNN. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I'm slow, but could we just take a sec to understand like what these uh, recurring connections are doing, like what actual operations are being implemented? I don't know like the, the specifics. The, they have like an inset in the top there that describes each local uh, recurrent layer. All I know is that this is supposed to process the image frames together. Um, so if I have a series of image frames that describe how I'm moving about that scene in the bottom left, um, this, would, this would be able to, to convert that in one shot. So I'm, I'm passing it in over time. And that's, that's converting information over time. I mean, certainly at some level it looks like layers in the cortical column. <laughs> I, based off of the, the, how they've um, uh, listed the names of thinking it's an LSTM, I can't be sure. Uh, okay. I, I'm just curious, are the backward errors adding back in or and what actually? That's the skip connection. Yeah, it's good thing. Is it simply adding back in, or is it doing some other operation integrating with the uh, with the earlier layer? It's just adding it back in. By by virtue of a skip connection, you don't want it to pass through any operations for your. Okay, so you device. got a smaller resolution there. Uh, what's the expansion operation that you can match it in? Yeah, so uh, there there is one fixed transformation that that scales it up. That's the only one. So you you're not actually changing the, the features that. So from F, FC six, for instance. And you're passing it back to conv one. Uh -huh. There is some kind of um, upsampling operation that's happening, but that's a fixed upsampling operation. It's not something that you, you're not changing the features that you've you've uh, learned in FC six to put it back to. But if it's, conv it's just like an image scale, or when you say yeah. upsampling, okay, yeah, yeah. all right, all right. Yeah. You're in the skip connections go backwards through the node. Yeah, is that, is that the same? That's not the recurrent connection, though, right? No. The current connections happen which within each uh, each block. Well, it's still a. And it is a type of recurrency, right? Yeah, is it the type of recurrence? Yeah. It? But these are, uh, I guess, I guess when I when I hear recurrence, I think of the actual recurrent layers like the LSTM or the the GRU unit, whatever they're using inside each layer. These skip connections. Uh, actually, you guys are right. You guys are right because. If um, they're just not temporal, they're just spatial. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I feel like it's closer to a calling it a recurrent connection than a skip connection. Like if I hear skip connection, I assume skipping a layer forward uh, and not uh, going backwards. So they describe it as skip connections in the paper. I'm I'm honestly wondering if the diagram means that they're going from even though the arrows are pointing from back to the front, I'm wondering if it means that the, the later layers receive information from the, the first ones, because I have also not seen it 
done like this, where information flows backwards. Um, well, I, if I was just visualizing what it was trying to do, if I basically got a blurred, maybe edge enhanced version of the original there, and I want to basically, by cycling through here, I'm crystallizing some blob. I mean, I, I can kind of see how it could kind of reinforce itself to uh, uh, center in on something rather than drifting from side to side or something like that. But that's just how I'm visualizing what that might look like in a graphical sense. <laughs> what I don't understand is how can the first layer perform, or how can the first layer receive information from the last layer when that data hasn't even passed through the last layer yet? I don't know if you guys have anything to note, or if you've seen this kind of architecture before, where future information is required to compute current information, which is why I was thinking that the architecture might actually be what we usually describe as skip connections, where information is skipped forward in the layers, not backwards. I so mean, yeah. That's always the case for recurrent connection that you have to unroll the network to compute it. But I have never seen it like this before. Yeah, so it, it depends how they're doing the time steps too. Is that like when they put that image in, did they go through and compute one iteration of every layer and then do the next one? Or is it just like completely pipeline? So you do, you get the next image everything just does one time step. And then you get the next image and you do another time steps and the information is sort of flowing back. And it kind of depends how they're managing the clock, if you will, or managing the time. I'm not sure which of those two it is, but it would seem like that, that even, even though that would be conducive to getting this uh, backward recurrent thing working, it's very, very slow. Like they would, I would think a, a, an efficient implementation batches by time you just pass in all of the frames at once. Mm -hmm. uh, again, I'm not not sure. I, I would think that if uh, if the feedback, what we call it, uh, things are temporarily displaced from the initial one, they're going to get a, a motion blurring effect. And I'm not sure that would be something that they intended, because basically you're going to see historical information there, and fresh information here. They're going to be displaced, and unless they're that's a they have a particular processing for that because they get motion vectors on how I would assume you pass everything through and then feed it back so they're registered. Time. Yeah. And then do then do the next image. Yeah. 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 That, that, that would otherwise it makes visual hash to me. Uh, even if I even if I did a single image at a time or by batch, that problem wouldn't necessarily happen, right? Since if even in a batch, I'm technically considering one image at a time. Um, well, it, if they're all displaced, if you say a batch, but they're displaced in time. Right, right. But the appropriate features in a particular slice of time are matched with the, the exact same raw image in that same slice of time. Well, you know, that, I think they were saying that we pass it all through. But okay. If, okay, you're saying that you could pass a batch of them through and then they would, they would synchronize in time by when they get finished. In an ear sense, you're looking at the elements of the batch being independent of each other. I, I suppose. I, I'm, I'm, this is purely conjecture on my part now. I have yeah. no idea how, how this uh, yeah, particular I mean, module works. I, I don't think there'd be a particular um, advantage in that if you're trying if, if you're trying to look at this thing as video frames as opposed to disparate things that are disjoint in time, then I think you could probably do what you just said. But if these things actually have some temporal coherence, I would think you would want to make some advantage of that. So is this just for feature extraction? This is purely so this is not no graphs, no graphs here. Yeah. So where is the output of this? Yeah, so that's the second part. This is actually the most minute part of the whole thing. <laughs> but but he, he, where are the features coming out? Is it from FC6? Because the arrow on the top left shows it coming out of COM1. This is again conjecture, but what I think is happening is that they, even though the output of FC6 gives you some output, what I'm thinking happens is they actually fetch the learned features in conv1 and use that as the output. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I think too. So then it's conv1 at the last time step of the network being unrolled so that the output is an image of the same dimension as the input image. Okay. But then what is the point? Okay. 
I can kind of I can see that. I'm just then wondering what is the point of the, the card. I, I'm not sure. Uh, uh, this kind of weird. Okay, but oh, but this is trained. Is this trained in a self-supervised way? This this is trained in a self-supervised way. So I, maybe I, that's what these things are there for. But I even if it was trained in a self-supervised way, um, are we treating it like a? This is like the decoder portion. Yeah, yeah. Are we yeah, exactly. taking the Something first like features that. of the first? Okay, maybe. Yeah, um, I don't know. Exactly. Yeah, it's like an auto encoder almost. Yeah, they, they they do describe how they do this by an encoder and decoder later. Um, by the way, I'm back, and, and and you guys hadn't moved on from the same slide, so couldn't, <laughs> couldn't have missed that much. Yeah, it was a bit confusing slide, but I think at the end of the day, what I'll be saying is not super important. Yeah, it's just a way of getting. Yeah, I, I heard that. <laughs> <laughs> so you didn't miss too much. I I, I chose wisely when to leave here. <laughs> okay, so that that portion is training the self supervised manner. Um, and they, they have this whole talk in the paper about why they can't just use a traditional um, encoder decoder architecture, um, because those latent states that you learn in that traditional architecture don't learn the physical structure of, the, of your scene explicitly. Um, and even in the cases where they do try to learn the physical structure, the decoders are very, very highly parameterized to learn from unstructured data that you're passing in the beginning. So even though the decoder, even though the encoder is not highly parameterized, the decoder must be to learn from the unstructured data that you're passing in. Um, so instead, what they, what they do is they, they use something called a zero parameter decoder to enable something called painting by numbers. So given your predicted attribute vector, which describes the, the physical characteristics of some nodes or vertices in that layer of hierarchy, um, they try to paint in specific regions given your ground truth of your scene segmentations. And your scene segmentations are the spatio-temporal registrations that I described in the beginning. But that's standard for any segmentation. Right? That's just like a standard process, right? Yeah, but they this is a, they don't explicitly describe how this is different from the from the first paragraph that I mentioned there, where decoders are very highly parameterized. Um, all they're saying is that there's two like they they elaborate and say that there are two ways to do the second point here, um, but the information that they require is only the attribute vectors, so the, the physical characteristics of what you're seeing. Um, in that sense, it's sort of like training a generative model to, to reproduce what you've mm -hmm. seen in the past. Any questions there? Okay. So this is the two kind of techniques that they do. Um, the first is something called quad quadratic texture rendering, which basically paints a quadratic function of each vertex's attributes in that set of corresponding pixels. Um, so the, the, the equality thing that I've, I've written there towards the end basically shows you the mapping between that vertex and the corresponding pixels in your base tensor or whatever tensor you're using for that hierarchy. Um, and this represents the raw pixels. Um, note that for this particular format, what you do need is you need the ground truth um, uh, pixels that, that you're looking at in order to input it and see how they, how they differ from your predicted one to the ground truth. But the second technique apparently does not require the, the spatio-temporal spatio registration. And the second technique is called quadratic shape rendering, which basically predicts the 2D silhouette of a node um, in that input scene. Again, given the vertex's attributes. Um, and in this case, the, like I said, the rendering does not need the actual ground truth um, pixels, since all we need are the, the, um, the silhouette. What, what do you mean by quadratic function? Yeah. yeah, so this, this section was very, very confusing. And they point to a lot of different papers that have, that have done this stuff before. Um, and they do the same for describing their, their loss functions for training these two uh, self-supervised strategies. They say that this has been done before in, in this work um, or, or various works. I did not read those works. I'm not including that here. I just wanted to include this as two um, basic techniques that they do to enable their self-supervision. Um, again, I don't think this is particularly relevant to how they build the graphs um, since these techniques have been done before. Um, in terms of self-supervised in painting. Um, again, the, the, more, the most critical thing here to note 
is this second point, which somehow means that this encoder decoder architecture that, that they're using somehow learns the physical structure of the input better than traditional encoder decoder architectures. I just want to note that this is what they say. I don't know how this happens. I just want to note that it happens. So, so, so can I think of this as you watch a video sequence moving around some objects, and this, this whole system is segmenting out independent objects and saying, okay, this glass is these pixels, and this phone is these pixels, and, and so on. And that's basically what this whole thing is. Then. Over time. Over time, time. yeah. Over time. In the beginning, it, with, with a single yeah. image, it's hard to do, but over time, it's easier because things move relative to one another. Correct. And uh, as you can see in this pipeline, this, uh, this, this module here happens sequentially with other modules. So over time, that would enable us to, to keep going um, further and further into detail as you explore a particular scene. So this thing will basically segment out the different objects and sub-objects. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it seems like that's, that's almost a harder problem than the building the graph itself. The, the graph building is harder because you, you need to understand how specific nodes are tied to each other. Um, and you need to do that also in an unsupervised fashion. I'm likening this to semantic segmentation, but done in a self-supervised way. So you have no idea what, what objects you're, you're segmenting. You just know that you're segmenting something. Right, right. Um, okay. Yeah. And, and, is, is it any more complex than it finds out which groups of pixels seem to move together? It's not more complex than that. Okay. Based off of how the, well, they, I guess intuitively that's what's going but I'm sure the technique. The heuristics that they use are actually similar to, to what you just mentioned in that they use, the, I'll, I'll explain that in a second. Um, but it, again, it seems like this is the relatively trivial part of this paper described um, by them. The, the, the further details go into how they explicitly build this graph from these segmentations. Um, and again, this is this is done in a self-supervised way. And if you look at if you look back to the top left, um, that's the features that we that we get from this extraction process. It's not completely segmented there. The portion the we try to segment things that are similar in, in, in structure, but the real um, separation happens when you actually build the graph. So you try to understand how does one node um, how similar is one node to another. That doesn't happen completely with this uh, convariant. So this is like a building block on top of which they, they build the graph. Yeah, so this is the last slide for feature extraction. They have the next set of the pipeline, um, which is called graph pooling. Um, and graph pooling is probably one of the most important parts of this entire pipeline. Um, and this effectively creates the within layer edges between nodes at a given hierarchy. Um, and using this, they create the next layers of vertices. Um, and uh, in addition to that, they also create the child to parent edge structure that goes from one layer to another. And also the registrations that describe how particular nodes that you now construct um, refer back to the, uh, the raw data, raw pixel data. Uh, and, and the way that they do this, I'll go step by step. Since they create a lot of different things, I'll go step by step. The first thing that they do is they create the within layer edges. Um, and they use this, uh, they do this by um, giving the data from your attribute vectors at that same hierarchy. Um, and the, the way they do this is they basically train something called a learnable affinity function. So for any two pairs of vertices in a specific layer, they output the probability that those two vertices are connected given your attribute vectors for those two vertices. So the loss functions um, that they describe here are based off of two, two heuristics that they, they, that they say. Um, and they call this um, something like perceptual grouping losses. Um, and again, these are heuristics based off of how physical objects are supposedly um, supposed to interact with each other um, in the real scene. The first one is called attribute similarity. So nodes whose attributes are similar to each other um, and have close spatio-temporal position should be grouped together. Um, so this might be like they have similar color or similar, like an edge continuum. Yeah, could be an edge. Yeah, both edges of similar edges or something like that, or similar textures. 
Right. And when I say position, I don't mean explicitly, explicitly displacement. I just mean how close are they together um, relative, um, relative to, to other objects as you see them through all the frames. Um, so those nodes who have similar characteristics in color and shape and are closely positioned together should probably be joined together. That's the first heuristic. The second heuristic is something that they call statistical co-occurrence. So nodes that appear often together throughout time, throughout your image frames, should also be tend to group together. So using these two heuristics, they, they effectively train a, uh, uh, an autoencoder to encode the pairwise differences and use reconstruction error as an inverse measure of affinity. So affinity is, is um, how, what's the probability of, of two nodes um, getting joined together in that hybrid edge that, that I described in the beginning. Um, so you can think of minimizing loss in this autoencoder as increasing affinity. How do they know how, how many vertices are at this level? Yeah, exactly. So that's, uh, I think I described that, yeah. And I described that in the next slide. Um, briefly, they don't. Um, okay. It's it's since it's done in a self supervision supervised manner. Um, there is no. It's not like k-means clustering where I know exactly how many clusters I want. It just keeps going. Um, I think until some threshold is reached. Um, oh, okay. Okay. So they try to figure out how many vertices it should be. So the, the vertices are implicitly described by this last point on the slide. So probabilities between um, the connections between two vertices are thresholded in the adjacency matrix. So I can't technically just keep going on and on forever if my probabilities are thresholded. So let's say if uh, two vertices have some statistical co-occurrence that is greater than 0.5, then I decide to, to, to threshold that and add that to my new hyper edge. In that, in that next layer. If not, then I don't do anything. So technically the process stops once I'm under some probability threshold. Okay. But like you said, there's no fixed set of, here's how many vertices I wish to create in this layer. Which is a benefit. That, that is a benefit, yeah. So after that process is done, graph pooling also clusters the resulting graph using something called um, labeled propagation. So it's worth noting at this time that we already had um, this, we already had the vertices in that layer, and we predicted this, we predicted the hyper edges between the vertices in that layer. So now the second portion is something called label propagation. So for every single vertex in that layer, um, we basically assign a random unique segment label to that vertex and perform some n number of iterations of updating each vertex with the most common label in its radius. Um, what's a label? So a label here is the way they've described it in the picture here is based off of colors. They just assign it some random label, like a random color. Um, and they try to find out um, what's the most common label in that radius. Um, and the ones that are the most common, um, I think, get assigned to the ones that are most common are connected to each other, as you can see in the second picture. So the first picture assigns all the labels randomly. And the second picture draws connections between, um, uh, between labels that are most common in a specific radius. I don't know how exactly this, this process yeah, works. because if the labels are random, then, then there's no... Then there's no... Right? Yeah. Yeah. I'm interpreting this like it's just like k-means clustering. You initialize the labels randomly, and then you start uh, reassigning labels in each iteration. And there's a theorem that it converges. This just adds the extra step, and instead of looking at all the labels, we look at in some epsilon ball around each node. So this includes like some type of spatial information on top of it. I don't know if that's really right. That's, oh, just, that's the way okay. I'm intuiting this. Okay. So like the that's something that I don't think was explicitly described here because they say that label propagation has been done so much before. So just take a look at X and, and Y work. But I think what you just said just might be pretty crucial in the sense that um, part of this is re-updating the um, or reassigning the label based off of uh, given your random initializations, just like in Kimi's cluster. Um, so some label, most of the labels will probably be wrong, but you just keep re-updating them over and over as you as you build as you cluster. Is each label unique, or is it, do they find some ways of having some of these nodes actually have the same label? 
even though they're physically disparate? That's that's this this question. I think um, in the sense that in the beginning they are unique, but there is some relabeling process that happens that makes them not unique towards the end. Because I, I would think that the thing where you're looking at uh, how the attributes how similar they are, various other things would be a categorization mechanism at some point. It is, it is, but that's in the hyper edge. That's in the last, that's in this slide. Okay. Where um, if I want to create the, the hyper edge between the vertices, then I want to know um, how similar one node is to each other based off of their attributes, their physical characteristics. Okay. In this segment, all you're doing is clustering the graph um, explicitly. So you're using the edges that you described and you wish to cluster them to form um, like some clusters. That's what, what I'm sorry. So is, is in the previous slide, are we talking about these these nodes? Uh, I'm trying to figure out whether the labels uh, the labels are merged out of what you used to call a, a node in the hypergraph, or whether this this thing here is we're actually labeling the node once it's been identified. Are you referring to labels as labels here? Yes, I'm, I'm trying to I, I'm trying to figure out whether in two slides or at two different levels of, uh, of a semantic hierarchy or whether we're one is feeding into the other. Okay, so the previous one, all it does is for a given scene, it tries to understand how specific vertices are joined together in a specific hyper edge. But what I haven't done, if I only did that step, what yeah. I haven't done is understand how one cluster relates to my parent cluster that I had before. Oh. And that's what this is trying to do. I see. Okay. So, so you're trying to send the hierarchy. So this is this okay. is what sends the hierarchy. So okay. the, the, the last sentence here is the most critical. The resulting clusters form the next layer's vertices with child to parent edges defined as the map from the original vertex to the new cluster label. I, I think Kevin had a good question that was also baked into that bigger question. Um, if we run with the k-means analogy, k is like a parameter that you select that from. So uh, how do they decide, or like, do they decide? How, how do you decide k, basically? The, the clusters that you're forming here are explicitly related to the number of hyperedges that you performed in the previous step. And the number of hyperedges that I formed in the previous step are done purely by probability threshold. So there is no limit to how many I can create until I've until I've come below with some some until I've come below some probability threshold. That seems like that is telling you how many basically how many vertices there are in this, how many labels there are. In other words, k is a different thing. Am I understanding correctly? What I tried to when I tried to think of the word clusters here is. How does one edge and all the vertices in that edge correspond to the next layer's cluster? Or sorry, the next layer's um, edge and the next layer's set of vertices in that edge. That's what I'm thinking of as a cluster. I might be wrong, but that's why um, the clusters here don't need uh, So the last point here, I say I can create an arbitrary number of clusters. The way I'm visualizing it is that's explicitly dependent on how many um, nodes that I started off with in that edge. And that's what's arbitrary about this. It sounds like at the very, very lowest level, there's an aggregation mechanism that's fundamentally based upon properties that you and I can understand. But then as you ascend the hierarchy, um, it becomes more and more abstract in what makes this thing more similar to this thing. So I'm just kind of curious, too, as you go up to the hierarchy, does it still have this notion of uh, of, uh, of attributes being propagated up, or is it purely some other abstraction from that? You have these attribute vectors, which we define very okay. abstractly. I just want, I don't know if the first layer is just grounded in something, the other ones are. You're saying, how do I preserve granular features as I keep going down, right? Uh, I'm, I'm saying you, you start out at the bottom, right? Okay, and you start seeing these things you know, start to emerge, okay? So for that first level of aggregation, you're looking at pixels. So, okay, I can kind of cluster them. I got the moving things, I got all that kind of stuff. Either. But then the next level up, do you still have those probabilities that you had in the first level? Yeah, so that's, that's actually the, 
now that I understand your question better, that's the next stage of this pipeline. That's called graph vectorization. That's when this explicit aggregation happens. Okay. Um, sorry again, this might be very confusing. This, this, this slide and the last one. Um, yeah, I'm getting a bit lost into where this falls into the whole thing. I don't know if there's like an end picture of what their graph looks like yeah, or. There is. Um, I can. That's, yeah. um, I, I didn't want to show that picture in the beginning because it's a huge pipeline. And okay. It's incredibly confusing. So I'm trying to take it piece by piece. Uh, I, think, I think what we're doing is we're spending a lot of time on the pipeline. Maybe we're, it, it's super tight suggesting it would be helpful to know where we're ending up. Because um, you know we have to ask ourselves, well, how many of these details really matter to us or not, right? This is what oops, this is what it looks like at the end. Um, if I had, if I start off at that very beginning, and I go through this this pipeline, that's this is effectively what I what I have at the end. The the middle picture, or the sorry, the second picture takes a look at takes a look at the cone that I have, I think, um, in the in the original raw data, and I keep segmenting that over and over until I get some components in that code. And this is the graph. This is, the, <coughs> these are the hyper edges at the first level. These are the hyper edges at the second level. And these are, I guess, all the nodes containing that single hyper edge that I'm looking at. Okay, so that middle one might be the Christmas tree thing. Yeah, I, I, okay. I think these are all segmenting the Christmas tree, like it goes deeper into the Christmas tree. Um, I'm, uh, I'm sorry, I'm confused by that. You're saying, you're saying that the third image here is just the Christmas tree part, or is it is how yes. the whole? It's yes, still... I, I think that's I think that's a better way of looking at this. Yes, these so, are all clusters within that Christmas tree. And then the final, what's the final image then represent? The, the final one is is entirely abstract. It could be any one of these, but it's some part of that Christmas tree that the that the system has potentially recognized as a sub object within this. This cone. I would thought that the one on the right would be the Christmas tree relative to other things in the scene. Isn't that the, the overall goal here is to figure out the scene graph? Yes. The way I'm looking at it is if I started from all the way at the end and worked my way to the top. Uh, which, what do you mean? The left side uh, going to the right? Or? The right side all the way to the left side. Then I'm starting with the most granular features some aspects of the cone, and I'm working my way left, left, and left until I get to the cone. <coughs> but, but isn't the goal of this to do a scene graph? This is, like, a, scene. This is a scene graph in the sense that I've, I've segmented various parts of my scene. I understand. But, but just knowing, knowing where the tree is, is not the scene graph, right? It, knowing, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm basically confused. I thought in the end you'd end up with like, Here's a graph representing all the objects in the scene where they are relative to each other. Um, oh, with like with labels, you mean? Well, or just just a graph representing the scene, whether they're labeled or not. Oh, okay. But what you're, what you're, if I'm hearing what you're saying, what what this picture here represents is just figuring out that there's a tree. Uh, <laughs> As I, opposed I, to the, this is probably the wrong picture to show them. I, I know exactly what you're, what you're asking for, and I can show that after. The presentation it's in the it's in the paper um that's but, it, but isn't that the goal of the paper to do scene analysis yeah it's a, that that particular that image i left out because it was like a, a weird 3d rendering of this entire graph but i i, I think i understand what you're asking for so this um, is a subset of the whole thing this image here represents it. how do we figure out there's a tree and the tree itself is a graph of different levels of hierarchical composition Yes, yes. And you can okay. use this information to build a 3D render of your scene where each individual part of that scene represent, is represented by, um, or you understand how each object in that scene is in relation with the other objects in that scene. And you yeah, can but this, this picture doesn't show that, right? This, this, this picture, picture doesn't show that, yeah. Okay, this yeah. picture shows how the different parts of a tree are related to other parts of the tree. Yes. And th this is, I mean, th this picture also doesn't show the full picture in the sense that I can't, if, if I wanted to show you, um, if I zoomed in on this hyper edge here, I could. And I could show you all the different components of the ground on which the ball and the cone lie. 
this is only this is just for clarity that it's only I'm pretty sure it's only zooming into the code. But this is like a, a multi-layer um, expansive graph that's growing. So it would it would expand into all of these individual hyper edges that you started off in this layer. Hopefully that gives some idea of the end goal. I can show a better picture towards the end. Um, I can go back to maybe the... Uh, oh, well, I guess the end goal would be a, a scene graph, but, but you're saying maybe, you know. I, maybe I can show that explicitly after, after this. There's only one or two slides here. Uh, okay. And this describes the aggregation process. Um, so, this module here is called graph vectorization, and it happens in sequence with graph pooling. Um, and it happens over and over again. And this is how you segment for the for the uh, damage that you have. So this effectively aggregates the initial attributes that you started off with according to the edge structure that you predicted from graph pooling. So the aggregation step is actually pretty important because it preserves the, the, the details of this graph as it becomes coarser and coarser at higher levels while still allowing you to predict new attributes to encode scene properties that aren't just simple functions of your low, lower level uh, nodes that you started off with. So what does this mean? This effectively means that I don't have one of two things happening. One is um, as I go deeper and deeper into a particular object, I don't just lose information um, about where it was with respect to the original um, nodes that represented the whole object, that's one. And the second one is that those lower level properties, uh, sorry, those, those coarse properties are not just functions of the original objects um, or the nodes of the objects that you saw in the beginning. So it works both ways. Um, this aggregation step is pretty confusing. Um, they, they, they kind of uh, jump over this. They say that they tried a few different methods to, to, to do this aggregation step. And they show us two of the methods, and I'll show that in the next slide. But um, assuming that this aggregation is done using some kind of techniques that they've listed, they then use some regular multilayer perceptrons to approximate something that they call graph convolution, which allows information to be exchanged between vertices in this graph. And finally, the output of this graph vectorization is the output of this MLP. And this transforms your, your, uh, your initial attributes um, a of L into the next layer's attributes A of L plus one. So what, what is the goal of graph vectorization? It's to preserve it. Yeah, so it's it's to, if I, the way I saw this was if I didn't have graph vectorization, then I wouldn't know how one node communicates with another node. I have no way of, of I, I've, 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 <clears throat> I've abstracted what, what does that this, mean communicate? I've, I have all this information about each individual node, but I have no way to understand how they work together. Um, if I wanted to have, if I had several nodes to represent, let's say this, this, um, this class here, I have no way of aggregating them into one node that describes all the properties of various nodes that represent this. And this is necessary for me to build onto the next node. I need to start off with a single vector that represents everything that I've found. So is it just clustering vectors into what might belong to the same object at that level? It's not cl that cluster. I thought that was the exact problem. That, that, yeah. That's already happened. So this is, is this is trying to um, okay. If I had individual vectors that described potentially different parts of this of this um, of this mug, all the aggregation step is doing is joining all these individual vectors into a new vector that describes one particular aspect of this of this uh, of this class. And that particular vector is used on the next layer to build even further information about, I guess, another part of this. this so it's kind class. of summarizing, yeah. in some sense, it's summarizing it into a new representation Correct. that's, um, that's captured multiple vertices. Yes. And okay. So the, what, uh, I mean, just some additional thinking here. This, this looks exactly like graph deep learning when you can say they're approximating graph convolution. It's more complicated because you're building the graph, like you're deciding what are the nodes and the edges as you go. So you're like building the graph and then doing graph learning on it simultaneously. But like one of the normal things that you would do with graph deep learning is just try and get a vector representation of a graph that's useful for a particular thing. Like 
classifying rather or not a like molecule will behave in a certain way, let's say. But um, like what's the loss function? Like what are they actually optimizing for when they try and get this vector representation of a graph? Yeah, so that's 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 the tech, very briefly the techniques <coughs> that I'll show in the next slide. I have no idea how they work. All I know is that they consider two different things or a few different things. Um, but to, to, your, to answer your original point, the only difference between this and traditional graph-based deep learning is that graph-based deep learning has no need to preserve all the features that I've seen because it doesn't need to cluster a node into a new node, right? I already have the graph representation. I'm just trying to understand how the data fits best with all my vertices and nodes in that graph, right? I'm not summarizing all the information in order to create new sub nodes or, or child nodes. That's what this step is for. Right. Okay. So you have like these different parts of the image, let's say, that are segmented and there are nodes associated with each of those chunks. Yeah. And so this is basically doing something like graph deep learning on each of those separate graphs. And each of those graphs are really part of the whole big thing. So graph and node are sort of like interchangeable when you think about a uh, you just change a level of the hierarchy of graph becomes a node. Yeah. And I, I get why. Is that, that, yeah. Is that the point you were making? That is that's sort of the point. And I, and I understand why this is confusing because it seems like we're reclustering everything where I already had the clusters, but that's not what this is doing. In order for me to create new information at the next layer of the hierarchy, um, I need to have a summary of everything. Yeah. That so I it's like a summarization yeah. or some. Um, yeah, uh, more compressed representation of the thing. And I can't do that if I just concatenate all my, my right. vectors in the past because that's 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 this point here. Um, I want to retain information from my base tensor, and I also want to retain information from the, the features that I've just learned, the granular features that I've just learned. And that's this is the best way to do that. Can I ask, is does this thing allow in principle something like I've got a bunch of n segments, and somehow I'm able to group them and then deduce that they're round or something that's a higher order than just, you know, oh, I've got a segment in, in space that is adjacent to the next one that's a closed curve. But am I able to get something, a higher level of abstraction? Like I can say something about it, I can deduce that it has some property which we would call round or something like that. That's what happens inside the attribute vector, yeah. That's that's something that I've stored as I sequentially produce right. this graph. But I'm just what, just because they're saying, you know, there's like a canonical set of operations that they do on those things, which would be any kind of feature detection thing where you're trying to look at, okay, I look at this local region, what's the first order, second order moments, and stuff like that. But what I'm wondering is, you know, when you look at the child nodes, pull some kind of statistic out of them that's either common or it's, it expresses them as a cluster, mm -hmm. you get a, a boost in abstraction somehow that you see something higher order about the thing, or is it just simple atomic processes that say, okay, well, I've got, you know, n different values for this thing, I just do variance on it, and, and, you know, I'm kind of done. I was just wondering, you know, because there was a reference there of, of, of getting more information. And I'm just wondering if this is, you know, for the low level properties, the higher level properties, is, is something like if that kind of abstraction climbing something that this thing actually is capable of doing, or is, is it you've, you, you've got these 10 statistical operations, and that's it, just looking at affinity for those things. Trying to understand your question. Uh, <clears throat> I'm, I'm trying to think of what the expressive power is when you move, uh, when you when you look at these child nodes and, and then find a a you concoct a attribute vector that summarizes those nodes. As opposed to not doing that, you're saying. As 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 opposed to um, <clears throat> does something emerge something interesting emerge from that, or is it? In, in that clustering process. In other words, the example I gave was, you know, you could say, okay, I've got a bunch of line segments and I can say, okay, the first order, you know, the moment of inertia around these line segments is something I can compute that from the right there. Oh, okay, fine, that's it. I haven't really discovered anything. 
or is there something that said, oh, okay, I've got another one over here. Do I start seeing something where something emerges from, from that, that's a higher order thing because of these techniques, or is it, I only, I can just say what the first order moment is of the next thing up there, the next thing up there. Is it, are you bounded by the statistical measures you have for these, for these attributes, is what I'm saying. I think this is two separate questions. I don't know which which aspect you're you're, you're focusing on. The summarization just ensures that I don't miss out on, on features that I had previously. But this the I, I don't know if you're focusing on that or if you're asking about how do I um, How do I understand if two nodes share similar properties when I, even before this step, during the pooling step? Um, how do I know if, like, you, you, gave, the, you gave the example of, of two nodes potentially being inside a round object, right? How do I know that they're similar to each other? I don't know if you're focusing on the graph pooling step, which effectively clusters based off of similar information, or this step, which tries to summarize all the nodes in that cluster, or the latter. The latter. And you're asking what properties does this allow as opposed to me not doing this? Like this is something interesting you know, arising I, from this step. What, I, what I'm saying is, I'm asking what's, what's happening. It says, vectorization well achieves by taking means, variances, first order moments, higher order statistics over each of the vertices child nodes. Is that it? I mean, there's oh, five yeah, operations yeah. that they do. Yeah. That's it. That's the only there's, thing they look at. There's more. There's there's. They, they experiment with a variety of different summarization tactics. Okay, but whatever they do, it's consistent across the whole thing. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's not different per, per step. Okay, so so I guess I guess my question is, is it sufficiently rich that something like some property like roundness could emerge? Yes, yes, I, I think so. Okay. I think so. Um, this is a very simple picture to try to understand what's happening in that step. Um, if I have individual nodes inside my cluster or my, my hyper edge here, I'm trying to summarize them with various different things. The first one computes the volume inside a, inside a specific object, and the second one computes the, I think that's the line integral, to compute the contour of that image. Um, but th this is just stuff that you, you try to aggregate as much information as possible, and then add all this information to your NLP to try to come up with some summary of all the different attributes inside that object. You use this summary to then produce the next layer set of, of, of vertices. Again, I don't know the specific loss functions that they're using to uh, how they train this graph vectorization module. All I know is that they consider these different statistical measures to help summarize um, your, your attributes inside this, this one hyper edge. Um, the full process, I've already shown this. Um, let's see if I have. So I, I just, I hate to drag it back, but on the thing it said it goes into something that's MLP like. How is that MLP learned? I, I, have, I have no idea how that sells. I don't know the loss function for that. Okay, um, but I mean, is it, is, it, is, it, is it trading on the fly or is it a pre learned thing? No, it's trading on the fly. Okay. Yeah. Okay, uh, I had one more slide here to discuss caveats of this, but instead I think I want to show the, um, I want to show the image that Jeff asked for. And I can find it. This is sort of what the end goal looks like. I don't know if I can zoom in even more. I don't think I can. This is what I showed you right now, this, this thing right here, where I'm effectively just zooming into one particular object of, of, uh, from the graph that I've built of that object. And I keep building that graph until I get to some fine-grained details about some specific part of that object. I'm going to skip over this right now 
Um, and this is just, I, I'm pretty sure this deals with um, the uh, label propagation and how I've, uh, how I've assigned a specific node in the graph I've built to the original 2D object uh, or to the original 2D pixels that I'm looking at. But this is, I think, more interesting, which is the 3D rendering of the graph that I've built. So I start off with all of these nodes um, in this scene. Um, and some of the nodes I, I basically cluster um, using the graph vectorization to basically summarize everything in that cluster that I've built through these stages. And effectively, after that, I can label here's where the ceiling is, here's where the wall is, and here's where the code is. Um, this is done implicitly, I would say. Um, that's a human going in later and saying that's a floor. Yeah, they're not yeah, actually they're not, classifying. They're not classifying this as a floor. Correct. It just says there's something. There's something from yeah, yeah. than everything else. But yeah. How do they measure how, how their results? How do they yeah show it working? Is there a video? Or there's. I couldn't find a video of this working, but they do try on uh, the few. Uh, uh, environments that I showed in the beginning. And there's some kind of, I, I can't understand what the, the metric is for understanding uh, the semantic segmentation task that they're trying to solve, but they do compare it against a few baselines. And they say that supposedly, I can, I can just zoom into the results here. I don't know if you guys can make more sense of this. It might be testing like, oh, what's that picture up there? That you can see the picture first. These are different scenes, right? Yeah, this is more like the, the 2D registration things um, that I was talking about. It's like highlighting the, the colors based off my graph onto the original uh, image frame. This is like the explicit semantic segmentation that's happening. Although I don't think this is that useful to see because this is no different than any standard semantic segmentation tactic. What's more interesting is how the graph is generated. I know that here exists something different from something else that's that's very close by in the graph. Is there an end goal to be able to do really good segmentation? Their, their end goal is to have a better, um, is to create a, yes, a segmentation tool that has a better inductive bias than, or sorry, a, a better inductive prior than CNNs, which is true from the get-go, right. because CNNs do none of this. Yeah. Is that really the goal? I, I would have thought the goal would have been more just like seen understanding. It's like kind of one step above higher picture. Since it's done in a self-supervised manner, I don't know what individual nodes are here. Like that's why the human goes back and labels, here's where the cone is, here's where the tree is, or here's where the graph is. Well, in some sense, in 3D, if you know where everything is, if you can segment everything out, then you sort of know the relationships already. Um, but you don't know that it's a Christmas tree or it's a wall yeah. or there's some object here that belongs to these this 3D subset. You know, it's Christmas trees, this 3D exact 3D volume as well. So you try to partition them out somehow. That and then if you know this is an object, that's an object, that's an object, then you know where it yeah, comes come along with attributes too. So if you had another scene yeah. that had a Christmas tree in it, you might be able to say something about that. Maybe. Maybe. I don't know if they do classification as such. Well, I don't know if like all Christmas trees would end up being more similar to each other than other things yeah. that are not Christmas trees. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, there it is a description, so, but we don't know if it's yeah. 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 So does that sort of make sense in the sense that the final step to get to scene understanding is having the labels of what I'm trying to predict? This doesn't do that. This is more scene decomposition into a graph which is, I think, pretty interesting, um, the, the steps that they take. So let me, let me rephrase that question. The, the reason I'm interested in this is because it seems like a step forward to scene understanding. Like at the end of the day, the reason you would decompose the scene is because you want to understand what's going on automatically in it. Is there, is there something I'm missing there? Like, is there, is there any other reason to do this whole line of work? That, that's correct, in my opinion. Um, if, I, if I did it, if I just took a traditional CNN that does scene segmentation, it's, uh, it's going to have a very hard time understanding the actual physical attributes of individual objects that I'm looking 
the only way it knows to segment is because it's seen so many different varieties of that same object during training. And tries to understand their contours. It tries to under, understand their shapes. But I think in the, at least in the, uh, Lewis was showing this in the, the habitat environment, where if I just change the colors of all the, the uh, objects in my scene, then whatever agent that I'm training to recognize those objects completely fails, right? This one performs a little bit differently. It's not doing scene segmentation just with CNNs. It's trying to understand the actual objects and the, the contours of the, yeah, the structure of the objects itself. Yeah. But so going back to what you're saying, Ben, I think I think there's a lot more you could do with this than scene understanding. Uh, scene understanding would be just like the start in some sense. Like you know, scene understanding, you know where the objects are and where their relationships are to each other, but you could use that as a basis for learning about objects like about Christmas trees. And so in the future you'd be able to under, you know, recognize more Christmas trees that are different. So you could use I think of this as more just as a starting point for everything else you might want to do with vision. So this is kind of a necessary prerequisite before you can, if you're if an agent is only getting visual scenes, not isolated objects, you have to do something like that in order to even get training data for phones and coffee cups and things like that. So it's kind of like a prerequisite. The, the, I mean, that yeah. framing makes sense needed. And I like I do view it as kind of a prerequisite, and it seems like a good step in yeah. the right direction. Yeah. I guess my yeah, I guess they haven't, but they haven't done it yet, but as far as I can tell. The questions I'm asking myself internally are like, what is like the overall goal long term for this type of research? Was this a useful step in that direction? And you know, which techniques that they use can I extract right and understand and repurpose? And there were a lot yeah. of different techniques used in this paper. Yeah, it's like a <laughs> lot of different things. It, it seems like, I mean, once you, once you have a, a principal segmentation that is higher than those you can see the code wise, you can start looking at, you know, okay, I can, I can, I can track this thing in the video from here to here to here. Okay, so that's the start. So I can recognize the thing. Can I use whatever that word representation was, that attribute vector, whatnot, and just blat it on, on, on some other random seed and something pop out of it? If I focus on just that attribute set, can I lift something out of a completely different scene that kind of tells me that there's some similarity there? Or is it, is it idiosyncratic? I traded on this one scene. There's nothing that's learned from there to the next scene that can be used somewhere else. That, that's one thing I don't know is, is you know, if it's done on you know, one sequence here, whether you give it a fresh sequence, does it, is there anything retained or learned or differentiated, or does it start off from scratch again and build up the whole thing in the base? Have they tried that? I guess is my question. They, they don't. They don't. But are we? Are you? Have you presented the everything you wanted to present? Oh yeah, I just I was just going to show the results next. But so, uh, can we go on to that? Sure. I'll, 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 I'll try to answer your question towards the end. Okay. Okay. Sure. Um, that that picture before that I was showing kind of tells you that they're trying to use the graph that they've built to solve the same scene segmentation tasks that other scenes are trying to do. Um, and I think the metrics that they do that, try to do that with are like a bounding box overlap standard metrics. Um, and it seems, it seems like this performs better than some of the baselines that they compared against. Um, but that's, that, that's not the point I wanted to highlight. The point I wanted to highlight was, there's a section in this paper where they say that, um, the generalization for this particular task is significantly better than, than uh, any of the other baselines that they compare against, presumably because those baselines are not building their own uh, graph representations, whereas this does. Um, and that's kind of where I wanted to get into the, the, the caveats and important takeaways of this paper. And I'll share the last slide that I have to show. Uh, 
So the premise is to present an approach to segment scenes or to come up with some way of, of, uh, of separating objects in scenes with better inductive bias than, than, than CNNs. And like I said in the beginning, it should really come as no surprise that this is better because the CNN cannot break down the scene into individual components. There's a lot of training tricks and details to enable self-supervision that I've glossed over a lot. Um, half of because I don't understand it completely and the other half is because I don't think it's, it's, it's important to understand the pipeline itself. Um, the pipeline itself is tailored to pick the best visual features in the network. Um, and this is not just in the, the feature extraction part, this is also in how the aggregation step is working. Um, this is all manually done so that the graph can effectively preserve important features as the graph is getting built. Um, the key thing to note here is that there's no learning of pose or orientation to build a graph. It's purely how one object is physically related or located next to another object. Um, and the initial results here show that it can seemingly generalize, generalize better than baselines. Um, but of course, this is, uh, uh, this is building an explicit graph, other baselines might not. And the test environments are pretty simplistic. There's nothing changing in scenes. The only thing that's changing is my camera angle with respect to some static objects in that scene. 